Hi, I'm John Tilka, a NASA co-op, and I'm here with Steve Bowen, a retired Navy captain, captain and uh, now a NASA astronaut. Thank you. Hi. I wanted to ask you about your experience in the Navy and how you guys use non-destructive evaluation uh, when you're undersea. Oh, well, non-destructive evaluation, you actually use it all the time. And obviously there's uh, some highly controlled non-destructive evaluation that you get to use, radiography in the shipyard in particular. Uh, it's not something you can take underway with you, not something you can take to space with you. Um, ultrasound for pipe wall thickness, we use that. Vibration monitoring, even sonar itself, we use that on uh, submarines to ana analyze ourselves and assess ourselves. In space, it's a similar, it can be very similar at times. Obviously, we do a lot of non-destructive evaluation on the ground for systems before we launch them. Uh, I think the space shuttle uh, external tank was a, a, a really good example of where they developed a very specific ultrasonic testing system uh, before they shipped the tank. It was pretty neat to go and see. Uh, so non-destructive evaluation, you know, it's been in sort of everything I've done since I graduated from college has had some little part of it, uh, ensuring that the vehicles I've been living on have been safe to operate. And it covers such a broad, broad range of things. Uh, and I mentioned some of the more specific NDE techniques, but we even went to the point of, you know, you're tapping on a pipe and you're listening and feeling for the response uh, as you go along. And in space, a lot of what you're doing is similar. You're, you're listening to the vehicle itself. You're listening for changes. You're listening for uh, things that are not quite right as you move around, if things move a little bit differently. And I know uh, when we go out and do spacewalks, the teams on the ground look at the video to see how our movements affect the vibration of the space station to, to do some load testing. So it's, it's sort of an everything sort of question, I guess, when you ask it like that. Awesome. So how long does it take for you to live in this kind of vehicle to get a feel for the health and that's actually an interesting question because you know we tend to fall back a lot on automated systems and uh, not always are they capable of picking up the subtleties and the trends and the the programming of the human mind so I always thought a, an intelligent operator was key to ensuring that we were getting the most out of this testing obviously you can go back and you take the data from a vibration monitoring system and you can do a pretty high level assessment of what bearing is going to fail, where the, the problems are. Uh, but somebody ne standing next to the pump doing that first cut often was able to pick up a lot of that stuff before we could even get it analyzed. Similarly, on, a, uh, on either vehicle, as I said, if you're listening carefully and you, you know what normal sounds like, that's a very important thing. Or you know what normal looks like, what it feels like. It takes time to establish that. You know, it could be in terms of weeks or months. Uh, there's always the anecdotal stories of the, the crew member on a submarine that hears a, uh, a squeeze, you know, a change in the tone that he associates with changing in depth, and he, and he reports it, and suddenly the, the boat is a little more concerned that they didn't know they were changing in depth. <laughs> you know, it, it, it takes that sort of awareness in the vehicle you're living on, and that's, you know, that's separate in a sense from the engineering side of it, where we actually can take the data uh, and have people who are experienced with the data as we are, you know, mission control down here with the space station, they can look at the, the information they get back on the loads and the monitoring of like the uh, uh, CVMs and that, uh, yeah, CMGs, I should say, the control moment gyros. They can look at that data and they can tell you ahead of time uh, how they're operating. And that, that real-time monitoring is key to make sure that the vehicles are safe to live on and operate. So you're talking about the aware user. Yes. How important do you think for when you're doing long duration space exploration, are those automated systems going to be for allowing you to Well, that's time? actually uh, something I've put a lot of thought into. On a submarine, we were, uh, you know, we had initially started off with like a vibration monitoring system. The electrician, we'd have to go out to the, each individual pump. We had points that we could take, uh, trying to get that wired in to a continuously monitoring system or the ability to monitor it when we wanted to. And I think that that capability is even more important on like a space vehicle where you don't have that size crew for one. You're not going to have the same number of intelligent operators out there listening, aware of everything that's going on. So they're going to need that data, but you'll need people on the ground who can read and understand that data 
so you can pick up the problems before they become problems because oftentimes you can change the way you operate to allow you to operate for a longer period of time or more safely uh, with a you know a degrading system as opposed to a failed system if you continue to operate as it is uh, so as we go forward we need to look and figure out how we're going to do that assessment without sort of the crew time and the crew tasking the crew members uh, there to do it uh, we can obviously send the information back to the ground where we can have whole teams look at it but it's always going to be that first cut as it passes through that's the guy that's going to pick up the, the problems initially so any vehicle you build at this point you really need to put in different monitoring systems I, you can you can imagine all sorts of interesting ways of looking at you know fluid systems and piping and uh, you know vibration on pumps and motors and you know structural uh, measurements that that can help you understand the performance of the vehicle that data just needs to get back to the ground or uh, back to where the people can assess it on a submarine obviously it was on board uh, for most but we would send data off periodically to to get other people to look at it as well but it's it's vitally important for the long-term health of the vehicle and it might lead you to you know change the way you operate to allow you to complete a mission or return safely if it's you know a system that's degrading rapidly uh, as opposed to if something fails outright that you could have detected earlier usually that's a lot worse than uh, operating with a degrading system so obviously knowing your system as it's degrading is important but you've had a lot of experience with EVAs and going out and fixing things after they broke. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, that's usually uh, when you do stuff. I had a lot of construction, which was good. Uh, on uh, SDS-126, we went out. We went out and looked at the uh, starboard uh, sarge, you know, the large rotary joint, which had damage to the surface of one of the bearings, and. You know, they, they had detected the anomalies in the vibration of the array in the motor currents uh, for the drive motors. And when the first people went out and looked at it, you could see the metal filings. So we went and cleaned that up, and we applied a, a layer of lubricant and returned it to full service, which is, I think, pretty amazing. Uh, but what they had done prior to that, they actually had, you know, constrained the operations of that solar alpha joint rotary joint so that it would survive. It survived long enough for us to be able to go and uh, do a little bit of maintenance. You know, if it had, if they had continued to run it blind to the knowledge that it was not running correctly, uh, you could have seized it up and it never would have been operational. So that's a really good example of where uh, that knowledge, that monitoring of, of a system allows us to go and repair it and extend its life. And because of that, you know, we lubricate the other side as well now and uh, hopefully that will allow it to last the life of the station. So when you have something that lasts as long as a space station, it's important to uh, kind of regenerate your workforce and transfer that knowledge of operations and how things are run onto the younger generation. Yeah, and that, that's an interesting thing because sometimes uh, the old guys sit around and they tell stories, you know. They, they've gathered up all this experience over uh, a lifetime of working. Well, the space program is, you know, over 50 years old now, and there are actually are very few of those old, old guys left. And the retirement of the shuttle, there was a whole other wave of tremendous experience that walked out the door. And capturing that knowledge is difficult because a lot of times you learn things as they happen. That experience that you get when something happens, you know, the first time, the second time, that just gets ingrained into how you operate, how you do things. Uh, that doesn't always make it obvious that you need to pass that on to the next person who won't have had that initial experience. It's just something you kind of know. So I think that there's a, uh, that knowledge of how the space station in particular operates as we proceed hopefully for another you know, 14, 15, 16 years of operation with the space station, we'll see a whole other generation of operators who come along and it'll be important that everybody that was there when we first detected the uh, motor currents on the Sarge or uh, we noticed the torn radiator panel. And those, those items we need to be able to pass on. What were the cues? What were the things that we learned? What were the changes? Uh, 
because if we don't pass that information on, you won't, they won't have that knowledge as when something else dramatically changes. At the same time, uh, having a history of this, having that long-term data that you've collected over time so you can see how something degrades over the life of the vehicle. What we learn from this vehicle uh, will be tremendously helpful as we go on, provided we learn the lessons and we understand how, uh, how it's going to degrade and what that means operationally and how we can extend uh, operations to, to meet the requirements and what we need to do along the way. And what systems, what, are we, what knowledge are we missing? You know, what was not built into the space station that would, would have been helpful along the way, that would have given us a little better insight into its operation and uh, its aging process. That, that'll be interesting to see over time. So what can you say to students to help inspire them to take up fields, particularly in like, in like NDE? Well, see, I, as I was discussing earlier, NDE is such a broad, all-encompassing term. I, I know uh, from my experience, uh, I had the good fortune of being engineer of a submarine and uh, spent a little bit of time in a shipyard environment, actually even as a junior officer. I think I spent a lot more time uh, than the guys actually wanted me to, you know, talking to the sonar techs, talking to the electricians, uh, talking to the radiographers as they came on board, the ultrasound technicians. I always had a lot more questions as, because it's, it's an amazing concept that you can do something that's, uh, you're not violating the operational construct Struct of the of the system, whether it be the piping system or the the pump or the motor, and you're learning a lot. You're learning understanding how it operates within it, you know, and, and it encompasses such a broad range of uh, science. Actually, you know, I, I I had a professor when I was in graduate school who said a wave is a wave. He had actually been a nuclear engineer, and he was teaching acoustics at uh, Woods Hole. And uh, he said, you know, it really is all part of the same problem, you know. And he was doing acoustic tomography, which to assess ocean environments, but in essence, that is ultrasound, you know, in a different frequency range, different scale. But it's, you know, understanding uh, the information you're getting back and what that's telling you is, uh, is incredible. And then for me, it was, you know, you see this piping system and you know fluid is flowing through there. Uh, over time, what is that doing to the interior of that piping? Is it, is, it, do you, is it corroding? Is it just eroding? Is it staying pristine? Is it putting a nice little protective coating of something else on there? Uh, so the ability to, to look at that and assess that and understand those uh, aspects of the system as they, as they get used is, is pretty, pretty cool. And you know, in a lot of ways, it's very exciting. And, um, yeah, I, I, I probably asked way too many questions of those guys. Who knows how many man hours I used up quizzing them because I just think it's, it's a very exciting field, actually fields. I actually used an IR camera. We had an IR camera on the boat and uh, it was, we had used it on board. We had it on board for firefighting reasons, but we had started to use them for cable inspections and we were able to identify different, you know, a, cables with different problems and get them repaired by using an IR camera. And, uh, and so I think learning from that, it's just amazing what you can do with some of these techniques and such a broad, broad just wealth of places to look. And it expands, you know, what you learn uh, maybe in one area, as I pointed out, will carry forth into other areas as well. Well, Steve, thank you so much for coming to talk to us. Oh, my pleasure. It was really, really a lot of fun. Very exciting field.